Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Open our ears to hear the stories of Jesus in new and fresh ways. Lead us to a renewed sense of awe toward the sheer magnitude of what he taught. Prepare our hearts to be fertile soil that we might bear the fruits of your grace and compassion. Amen. The first reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah. It's on page 668 in the Old Testament, in the Bible uh, in your pew. Uh, it's verse 21 and then verse 28 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. This is a reading from the Gospel of Mark. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out in the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came out, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still others felt seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may ever be seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30 some 60, some 100 times what was sown. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Do you not know have you not heard? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? 
So those are the questions that Isaiah was asking his people in the reading from the Hebrew Bible today. But I have to be honest, when I read those questions, even now, this is my favorite, this is one of my favorite passages, but every time I, I read it, I don't read the questions like that in my head. I read them like this. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Have you, how, how do you not understand? How do you not get this? That's how I hear it in my head. And it's possible that that is what Isaiah meant. It's possible. The prophets in the Hebrew Bible are very often frustrated. They're very often yelling at the people they're writing to. But I, I wonder if that really is what Isaiah means here. I wonder if he is saying those questions with the sort of frustration and anger with which I, I am putting on those questions. Because he follows up by talking of the love of God, right? He follows up with words of just enormous comfort and compassion. He reminds us, glasses on, he reminds us that the Lord is the everlasting God and that God will not grow tired or weary, that God gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. He doesn't follow up those questions with frustration. He follows them up with great compassion, with reminding us of what God is and what the love of God looks like. So there's a different way to read those questions. Maybe it's not, do you not know? Maybe the question is, do you not know? Do you not understand? It's a very different question, isn't it? I've worked as a hospice chaplain for several years. And one of the things I've learned is that sometimes people don't know. Right, we're lucky, we're sitting here in church, we've heard these stories, we know, we know the stories. But sometimes people who know the story, sometimes people who know about God, who know about Jesus, who know about this earth-shattering love, sometimes they don't understand. So I'm going to tell a story, because that's how I make sense of the world. It's the only way I know to make sense of the world, is by telling stories about it. I wrote an essay when I was working as a hospice chaplain, and it was on CNN. True story. And it was very popular. And I got a phone call from a producer for PBS while I was making lunch in the morning. Her name was Martha. She said, Harry, I read your essay and Religion and Ethics News Weekly. We've never done anything on hospice chaplaincy, and I don't really know anything about it. And I thought, maybe, could I ask you a few questions to see if there's even a story there? And I said, well, sure, I've you know, got five minutes making sandwiches. And she asked me some questions. I tell her some sort of very basic answers, you know, sort of chaplaincy 101. And she says, Carrie, I gotta tell you, I think you're fantastic. I think you're great. And I'm a little bit ashamed to say, I fell for this immediately. Immediately, I was like putty in her hands. And I said, oh, Martha, thank you. Well, you know, I'm very passionate about what I do. And you know, I believe strongly in hospice care. And she said, great, that's great, that's great, Carrie. Because she knew she had me. She knew I was hook, line, and sinker. Here's what I'm going to do, Carrie. I'm going to come up there with a film crew, and I'm going to follow you around while you're visiting your hospice patients. And I said, no, whoa, oh, no, 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 that is not, no, we can't, no, that is not what we're going to do. And she said, why not? I said, Martha, I can think of 10 reasons off the top of my head why we can't do that. And she said, OK, what are they? I said, number one, HIPAA. She said, people can sign releases. I said, number two, my boss will never go for it. She says, you haven't even asked your boss. She had, a, she had an answer to every, everything. I said, number three, none of my patients will go for it. And she said, you haven't even asked your patients. I said, oh, Martha, that's just it. I never will. I will never ask my patients if they want to be on TV. She said, why not? I said, it's not a fair question. Right, I'm going in there as their chaplain. 
My job going in there is to meet their spiritual needs. It's not to meet your needs to be a TV producer, and it's not to meet my needs to be on television. I said it's to meet their spiritual needs. It's not a fair question. It puts too much pressure on them. And she said, you would never even ask if someone's interested? And I said, no. Listen, Martha, unless someone says to me, I have a spiritual need to be on television before I die, it's never going to happen. I said, and that will never happen. And she said, all right, well, what's your boss's name and number? We'll start there. And I gave her Sandy's name and number because I had to get off the phone. I had to get my kids to school. So I go to the office 20 minutes later, and Sandy says, my boss, she goes, talk to your friend Martha this morning, Carrie. I said, oh, Sandy, I'm so sorry. I didn't know how to get her off the phone. She said, no, no, don't worry about it. It's okay. But listen, we have a new patient this morning, and I'm wondering, can you reorganize your day? Because he says he really needs to see the chaplain. He says it's an emergency. It's pretty unusual in hospice to have an emergency, but okay. So off I go, and I meet Jim for the first time. And he says to me, he's dying of liver cancer, by the way. He's very, very sick. Can't get out of his chair. He says to me, I have always had a very close relationship with the Holy Spirit. So I know what it feels like. I know what it feels like when the Holy Spirit has a job for me to do. And the Holy Spirit has one last job for me to do. And I can't figure it out because it doesn't make any sense. But I know, I know that the Holy Spirit has a job but I, I, I can't make heads or tail of it, and, I, and I'm, 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 I'm so worked up, I'm anxious about this, because the Holy Spirit has a message for me to get out to thousands of people. How am I going to get a message out to thousands of people before I die when I can't even get out of my chair? And I said... Well, Jim, do you want to be on TV? <laughs> and he says, yes, yes, I want to be on TV. <laughs> Can you do that? Can you get me on TV? And I said, oh, I can this morning. <laughs> I couldn't do it yesterday. <laughs> so apparently the Holy Spirit has a much bigger imagination than I have. I had to call Martha and tell her, in fact, Martha, I do have a patient who has a spiritual need to be on television. So a couple weeks go by. We have a lot to organize. And I'm meeting with Jim every week, and, and we're talking. He has a lot to say, right? We talk a lot about the message that he has to get out, but we also, he talks about his life and the things he's been through. The day comes for the film crew to come. I knock on the door. And his wife, Elaine, answers the door, and she says, oh, no, you didn't get my message? And I said, no, what happened? She said, he had an episode. This so sometimes when people are dying of a liver disease, they'll, they'll have these episodes where their ammonia gets too high, and they become very, very sick. They become very delirious. They become very weak. It takes hours to recover. And she said, he had an episode this morning. He can't do it. And I said, okay, and we won't do it. Now, Martha, meanwhile, is behind me with her two her two cameramen and a sound guy and a, a, an interviewer, a reporter. And she says, what? What? I said, Martha, listen, that's the deal, right? I mean, you knew this was a risk. I mean, if he can't do it, he can't do it. And then we hear a voice from inside the house, and it's Jim. He's going, let them in. Let them in. This is my chance. Let them in. So Martha, she didn't need to hear any more than that. She had, she had two feet in the door already. So he went in, he did the interview. But Jim at this point was so weak, he was so tired, he couldn't lift his chin off his chest. He was very cold, he couldn't modulate his body temperature, so he had a hat on, he had five or six blankets over him. And he was so weak, he could barely speak. And I'm, I'm fully committed to the message now, too, right? We've worked really hard to get the message out, right? I'm fully committed to getting the message out. And I want to make sure he's able to get the message out, because this is so important to him. And he's barely able to talk. So 
I'm asking him all these questions. I'm actually being a really bad chaplain. I'm asking all these sort of leading questions, trying to get him to get the message out. And then we were done. So I went back the next day, and I was a little nervous because I didn't really know if he'd gotten the message out. Because the fact is, as much as we talked about the importance of the message, I didn't really know what the content of the message from the Holy Spirit was, right? I figured he was going to reveal it during this interview, and then he didn't. He could barely talk. He could barely move. So I'm a little nervous, right? Because I don't really know if the message got out. So I said, uh, how are you this morning? And he said, good. It was back to normal. I said, it was good. I'm really good. I'm good. I said, good. He said, I said, um, how'd it go yesterday? What'd you think? And he said, it was great. It was great. It was exactly what I wanted, exactly what I needed. Yes, it was great. I said, good. And um, do you feel like you got the message out? He goes, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I said, good, good. What was the message? <laughs> what was it? And he said, oh. Well, the message was you message was you and, and Patty, the nurse, and Elaine, my, my wife. The message was all of you. The message from the Holy Spirit is that there are people in this world who love you so much, they will take care of you even when you're sick, even if they don't know you. But there's that much love in the world. The message is that the love is stronger than the sickness, and, and the love is stronger than the death. That's all the message is. The message was all of you. The message was the love. And I, I think people saw that. I think people saw that. He didn't actually get to see his interview on TV. He died about 10 days later, uh, before it ever aired. There's a second part to the story. Seven years later, I got a message on Facebook from Elaine. It had to be her, it was an unusual last name. And so I sent her a message and I said, Elaine, this is Carrie. It was actually a comment on, on my Facebook page. I said, um, I was so happy to see your name. I hope you're well. And if you want to be in touch, I'd, I'd love to be in touch with you. But I also understand if you don't want to be in touch. I understand that too. It's, it's up to you. And she emailed right back and she said, yes, yes, I'd love to be in touch. And, and this is a little bit of an aside. For any of you, if, um, if you ever had a chaplain or a nurse or an aide or a social worker that worked with your family and you just loved that nurse, you loved that chaplain, and you wondered if they loved you back, the answer is yes. Yes. I can tell you that right now. They loved you as much as you loved them. And they might not have been able to say it. They might not have been able to make contact with you for professional reasons. But if you've ever wondered if that home health aide that you loved to pieces loved you, yes, she did. She loved you too. So I talked to Elaine on the phone. I was so happy to talk to her. So happy to talk to her. She sounded exactly the same. We were catching up. And of course, we talked about Jim and his crazy TV experience. And she said, you know, I have no idea why he was so insistent on letting that television crew in. And I said, well, I mean, he had to get the message out. And she said, what message? That he had a, yeah, the message from the Holy Spirit, right? That's, that's why he wanted to be on TV. He had a message from the Holy Spirit. And she said, he did? And I said, yeah. She said, I don't doubt it. She said, my husband had a very strong devotion to the Holy Spirit his whole life, the whole, whole time I knew him. She said, you know, Carrie, Jim talked to you a lot at the end. He didn't talk to me. What was the message? I got to say, the message was you. <laughs> The message was you, Elaine. He wanted people to see 
but there was so much love in the world that people would love you even when you were sick, even when you were dying, that that love couldn't be destroyed by sickness or death. That was his message. And she said, I don't begrudge the time that you and Jim spent together. He had a lot to get off his chest, I know that. And I, I, don't want, I don't need to know what he told you. I don't need to know, I never needed to know. She said, but I really wish he had told me. I really wish he had told me his message. I really wish he had told me that his love was stronger than the sickness. And over the last seven years, I really wish he had told me that his love was stronger than death. Because I have struggled. And I have grieved. And I wish he had told me. Because that would have helped me. It would have helped me to know that. These were two people who were very strong in their faith. These were two people who believed in the message of Jesus Christ. These were two people who believed in a love stronger than death. And yet even then, in the thorns of grief, she would have liked to have been reminded of that, even though she knew. In the parable of the sower, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God. He talks about his message. And this, of course, is before the crucifixion and the resurrection. This is before his disciples know what's coming. They don't know. They haven't seen a love stronger than death yet in front of their eyes. And Jesus talks about his message, his ministry. He talks about the kingdom of God as sowing seeds. He doesn't talk about it. These aren't like tulip bulbs, right? These aren't daffodil bulbs. These aren't big, giant seeds where you plant it once, six inches deep, and half a year later, you get a flower. These aren't bulbs. He's talking about seeds, tiny little seeds, right, that someone is throwing and they're scattering. And sometimes they're landing in thorns. And sometimes they're landing on rocks. Sometimes they're landing in good soil. But he keeps throwing them. He just keeps throwing them. He doesn't plant a bulb once. He throws them knowing sometimes they're not going to land in the right spot. He keeps throwing out the message of the kingdom of God. He throws out handfuls of these seeds, the sower, the farmer does. And Isaiah, he asks us if we know. But he also says, have you not understood since the earth was founded? Because he seems to know, and maybe I think, I think Jesus seems to know too that sometimes you can hear. Sometimes you can hear and not understand. Jesus asks his disciples that. Don't, do you understand? Do you understand this parable? Because there's a difference between hearing and there's a difference between understanding. And sometimes I think that, that, that fluctuates in and out in our lives. Sometimes we hear and we understand, and yes. But sometimes life is really hard. Sometimes there's death and disease and there's job loss and there's family estrangement and all sorts of really hard things happen in life. And sometimes we know the stories and we do not understand what in the world they mean for our lives right now. Sometimes it does not feel like there is a love stronger than death. It just doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't feel that way for years. For years. We hear or we don't hear. We don't understand. And I think a lot about what Elaine said. But I wish he had told me. And I think about what Jesus says. Do you understand? Do you understand that you need to keep telling the story of a love stronger than death? I think about what Isaiah asks. 
Do you not know? Do you not understand? I don't want to speak for Jim, though I still feel very strong obligation to get the message out. That's why I preached on it today. Every chance I get, I tell Jim's message, because I'm committed to the message too now. That there is a love stronger than sickness and a love stronger than death. But I'm also committed to what Elaine said. We need to remind each other of that. We need to make sure we, we know, not only that we are loved with a love so strong, but we need to remind each other that each of you is loved with a love so strong. Even when you are in the thorns of life, even when you are in rocky soil in life, that love does not grow weary.